and welcome to the Off the Charts podcast for week eight of the NFL season. I'm Mark Simon, along with SIS VP of football, Matt Menacharian. What's up, Matt? What's happening, Mark? Well, Matthew Stafford is the number one quarterback by total points. Rookies Asante Samuel and Patrick Sertan are at the top of the leaderboard for cornerbacks. And a shout out to Raiders punter A.J. Cole, who is averaging 52.6 yards per punt entering this week. Love the punters. Matt, who's your stat guy standout so far this season? I mean, aside from Matt Amodio and his 1.5 million in winnings, I, I heard him on, on the SIS Baseball podcast with Mark Simon. That was pretty good. All kidding aside, the, the skill guy total points leaders aren't surprising this season. You've got Derrick Henry and Jonathan Taylor leading running backs, Cooper Cup and Devontae Adams, Travis Kelsey and Mark Andrews. On defense, same story. you got Aaron Donald, Miles Garrett, Jalen Ramsey leading their positions. But the stat standout that I wanted to focus on is the interior offensive line on the Browns. For too long, offensive linemen were ignored by the stat pages. Not any longer. Joel Betonio and J.C. Treader both lead interior offensive linemen with 17 total points this year. Wyatt Teller is the fourth-ranked guard with 16 total points. The interior offensive line for the Browns, they're my stat standout. In practical terms, what does that mean? Does it mean that they protected Mayfield and Keenum well? Like, Just give us a sense of what that means. Yeah, in like a basic sense. On pass plays, it means that you're doing a good job protecting and not just doing a good job protecting like, oh, well, if Treader plays center, it's easier to play center. You have less one-on-one matchups. You have less beast pass rushers to go against. No, no, no. It's considering how well you perform above or below average and not just in terms of pressure rate, which can be controlled by the quarterback, but actually in, in terms of suppressing blown blocks. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into the calculation, but basically that's the most important thing you can do is not let the guy that you're blocking get through you real quickly. Similar story in the run game. We're looking at what the expectation for each type of run play is, right? So we ran zone off the right tackle here. What would we expect a typical team to earn in this situation? And then where's the performance above or below that? And which players were responsible for that? So when you add that all up, part of it is, yep, volume. The Browns are running the ball a lot. So the interior offensive lines involved a bunch in the run game there. But actually, it's easier to create total points in the pass game than the run game, even for offensive linemen. So they're really standing out in both phases, these guys. So the Browns offensive line, certainly a key to their season, potentially a hidden key if their season goes a little bit beyond the regular season. Before we get to week eight, let's talk some NFL trade deadline. There are a lot of haves in the NFL right now, especially in the NFC. There are a good number of have nots. So maybe there are some matches there. Maybe not a lot, but maybe some. Among the teams that are viewed as Super Bowl contenders, you got maybe five in the NFC and then six or seven in the AFC, because we're going to qualify the Chiefs, and we're probably going to qualify Cincinnati. Let's identify the biggest and the clearest needs, and let's start with the Chiefs. When you talk about the contenders and and where things have gone right and where they've gone wrong, the Super Bowl hangover has been legit, but the biggest needs are on defense. I mean, we can can basically forget about what we saw this last week. That was an, an aberration of a game. It's not as if Patrick Mahomes, yes, the turnovers are up, but this is not that that he's fallen apart, that he's he does look like he might be a little bit hurt when he's moving out there. But I, I don't really have concerns about him, about the Chiefs offense. Offensive line still gelling. We said that was going to take time. This is the defense. This is the second worst run defense in the league. And Spags relies on his defensive line to be really talented, right? Think back to the great Giants defenses when they were beating Brady with their front four and really doing what they were doing there. They experimented with moving Chris Jones outside this year. He ranks 86th in pass rush total points so far this year, and somehow that leads their team. So it's not working what they're doing up front there. If a great 4-3 defensive end is available, bump Chris Jones back inside full-time and start to just get going with some real horses up front because I don't think, I think it'll be much harder for Spags to fix the defense by adding secondary players. It's really a lot of the, the same guys that they have back there on the back end that they've had in years past. The performance clearly hasn't been good. At the same time, I think we we underestimate how complicated a scheme what they do in Kansas City is, what Spags wants to do on the back end is. So it's a lot easier to plug in a 280-pound menace and try to get things revved up that way than to really change things on the back end. So if they are doing this, you would say get someone that's legit, that's going to be a, a close to every damn player? If you're talking about what you could do, what you know, what they could do, and I mean, the cap situation in it, all other, all other stuff aside, I'm not saying it would necessarily be a good idea to make a move and, and give up future assets. I think that's something they've probably done a little bit too much of in the past. But if you can get a player that can influence the defensive line, that can help your, your defensive line rotation in general, nobody's playing 100% of the snaps there, uh, except maybe Chris Jones. 
uh, I think it's it's beefing up that unit and giving yourself more flexibility. The more good players you have there, the more Spags can do with that front four. Chiefs are three and four this season. They're ranked 27th in points against. Not looking particularly good. Not panicking either. <laughs> you've, now, hang on. You've said that now. This is like three weeks in a row. I feel like that's come up. Yeah, and I mean, it's fair. They, they were bad last week. That was a concerning game. The offensive line finally looked as, as bad as it's looked. But I thought that they kind of were holding it together a little bit quicker than I expected, really. So I expected growing pains on the offensive line. I don't have any long-term concerns about Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, Tyreek Hill. That's the big three. It's nothing to worry about there. They don't have a healthy running back right now. Again, I don't care. I don't think that's the, the trade that's going to make a big difference for them, for example. The problem's been on defense and that the defense just hasn't been anywhere close to it. The other, the other problem's been a turnover luck. They've had turned the ball over, what, 16 times already this year, something like that, 18 times already this year. That's an unsustainable rate of turnovers that's also going to come back down to earth. So at the end of the day, between the, the turnover luck, luck kind of reversing, us getting back to remembering that Patrick Mahomes has still been pretty good this year, right? Like even with last week considered seventh in total points still, is Stafford, Brady, Cousins, Jackson, Murray, and Carr are, are ahead of him. And he's there uh, still ahead of Justin Herbert, Dak Prescott, Aaron Rodgers on the top 10 list. So even with everything that we've seen and everybody wants, oh my gosh, what's going on here? There are more losses than you'd like to see there. That's going to be the hardest thing. Nobody, everybody in their division's got two losses, though, right? It's not like they're they're way behind there. I think that they that they can still find a way. They've got to gel. They've got to come together. Hopefully, they can figure out a way to get past that that Super Bowl hangover. Let's swing to the other side. Let's look at a team that things look pretty good for right now. The Dallas Cowboys. Where do you stand with them? Cowboys. Maybe the, it looks different on on the on the records and everything. There is certainly in the driver's seat in their division. But it's a similar story. They're in the bottom third of the league on run defense right now. And that's really been their worst phase out there. So when I look at the Cowboys, uh, no concerns about them offensively. I think they've got you know depth at every position. Defense would definitely be the concern there. They've got some pass rush going right now. Randy Gregory's been good this year. It missed the game, but besides that, it's been great. Micah Parsons, has, I think they're starting to realize that he's really just a pass rusher, at least at this stage in his career. So get him involved in the pass rush game as much as possible. So it, it gives them something coming off the edge there. But I think if they could upgrade their interior, especially as that would figure into their run defense in January, I think that would really, really help the Cowboys because they're right there. You know, they're, they're a team that I think is, is positioned to try to make those moves that, that can put them over the edge. And, and I think they're a little bit thin on the defensive line. So as we get set to segue into looking at games for week eight, uh, there was one other question that uh, Matt wants to bring up. He asked me, if you were the Browns, would you trade Odell Beckham? I'm the one who asked the questions here. I will give a brief answer on this one, though. I think that if you're trying to win a Super Bowl, trading Odell Beckham would be silly. Matt, what's your take? I think you're probably right, Mark. I think there's been a lot made of, of how not on the same page Baker Mayfield and Odell Beckham Jr. have, have been together. And I think the struggle has been real when you've looked at it. Still, for all that, I, I come down the same play as you. I think this is a talented player. I think he can he can be a part of helping them win the Super Bowl. And then you look at the on-off splits, just just you know taking a, a look at some of the, the numbers. With Odell on the field, Baker is completing 60% of his passes. With him off the field, he's completing 79% of his passes. Better yards per attempt, better touchdowns per attempt, but actually more interceptions with Odell off the field than on the field. Small sample size. Uh, it's really been a similar story. I mean, it's been the opposite story for Case Keenum in small sample size. He's uh, uncoincidentally looked better with Odell Beckham on the field, as you would expect, Mark. So, no, I don't think I would try to trade Odell. Obviously, you know, depending on what the value would be out there, what the return would be, that would certainly make a difference. I think you'd be selling low in a way. So uh, I think he can be a part of what they can do in the long term. But man, they got to figure that out. Well, this gets to a larger point, and that's the idea that in the AFC, when I say like, you know, the Browns are trying to win a Super Bowl, there are like seven teams, six, seven teams in the AFC for which I think they would feel comfortable saying that we're going for it. I guess my question would be, should all of these teams, I, like I understand it for Buffalo, I understand it for Baltimore, less so for maybe Tennessee, less so for maybe the Raiders, less so for maybe the Chargers, the Bengals, and certainly the Browns, should all these teams be going for it? I don't want to say going for it in the sense of like sacrificing future assets. That tends to be something that I'm, that I'm not a big fan of. But in terms of going for it, yeah, everybody should be going for it. Like this is, this is football. This is not 
a sport where mortgaging your future is only going to take you so far. I'll, I'll be the first one to say that, that the Browns have certainly built a lot of the assets that they have on their team, you know, starting with Baker Mayfield and Miles Garrett by losing a lot of games. And, and that's how they got there. But this is a sport where finding a way to win, building the, you know, winning is hard. Winning is really hard in this sport and understanding how to win games and learning how to win games. And, and, you know, I'll say the cliche building a culture, but I really do believe that winning begets winning. If you start to lose a lot of games, you can start to have a lot of different problems fester. Winning games is a good thing for you. Figuring out how to win games and win them sooner rather than later. Winning games now is better than winning games later. All other things being equal. So I, I think that really putting your best foot forward in this sport is important. And the teams that have won the Super Bowl recently are great examples of that. Like look at the, the Bucks and the way that they've added to their roster and, and, and filled holes and, and taken those risks. So I think they should be doing that. Yes, I think the Bills, the Ravens, the Browns, the Titans, the Colts, the Raiders, the Chargers, the Chiefs. I think all of these teams are, are definite. The Bengals, interesting. Five and two. I didn't expect them to be five and two right now. Their quarterback looks like the real deal. Jamar Chase looks like one of the best receivers in the NFL already. Shocking that the guy who was better than Justin Jefferson in college and <laughs> was reunited with his quarterback is good at football. The Broncos, you know, is the quarterback situation figured out there? It seems like that still is something that's, that's a, a bugaboo for them. And, you know, four game losing streak they're coming off of now. But I mean, should everybody be going for it? Yeah, everybody should be going for it. I, I don't think that, that, Tanking is is a great strategy in general in football. Don't sacrifice you know extra assets that you're going to regret having given up down the road. But try to win the game. Week eight, let's preview it, and we begin with the Browns and the Steelers. And wow, so this is a huge swing game for the Steelers, who got off the mat and beat the Broncos and the Seahawks to get to three and three. If they win, they're over five hundred. They've got the Bears and the Lions coming up at home, so they could potentially get to six and three. But they have to win at Cleveland to do it. So let's start by analyzing the game this way. What are the Steelers' checkpoints in terms of winning? This is one of those games that is, this is division game. This is AFC North football. Steelers, Browns kind of throw it all out the window. You got to be informed by the stats coming in to understand who these teams are. But at the end of the day, I think that this game is, is kind of, there's so much familiarity between these teams. There's so many emotions that, that have gone into these matchups in the last few years that it becomes almost like, a game unto itself that's almost like separate from the rest of the season. But if we're going to rely on what we've seen, here's what, what my three checkpoints for the Steelers would be. Number one, find a way to get the running game going. This is a really tough task about Cleveland. It's like running into a brick wall. Why are you even going to try running the game? Am I listening to an analytics podcast where the guy's telling me to run the football? What's going on here? But the key to that to me is finding a way to not let Miles Garrett control the game defensively. We talked about how he's leading all, all pass rushers in, in total points this year. By running the ball and getting some sort of a running game going, I think the first thing that allows you to do is not let him just control the game. Because I think if you try to get into a drop back game, I think that you're going to have to really find a way to control that guy. Second thing I look at is quarterback play. They've been one of the worst passing teams in the NFL this year, but Cleveland has been inconsistent in the secondary. So I don't think you can sort of pass to set up the run. And I'm not advising that here, but I do think you need to have good Ben Roethlisberger show up. Like it, it, it can't Has he be. been there at any point? Uh, not enough. Not enough. I think he might have had one game this year, right? It's going to be it's going to be problematic if you're going to try to beat this team without without the with the level of quarterback play that they, they've had, because it's been sub case Keenum in terms of what what Ben's been doing this year. Upon further review, I take that back. But by total points, Ben Roethlisberger has not had one game with positive uh, points above average this year. So nothing that, 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 that jumps out as, as really, really atrocious, but also hasn't had a, a good game actually either. Maybe you count the game against the Seahawks as decent, but even there, 5.7 yards per attempt, not great. In our world's number one quarterback rankings, he actually ranks next to last. Uh, the only quarterback behind him is Justin Fields. So Baker Mayfield said it's absolutely possible that he could play on Sunday. I have no idea what that means. He wanted to play last week and he didn't. What does this game look like for Cleveland if it's Case Keenum at quarterback instead of Mayfield? You know, probably pretty similar, honestly. I don't think really this is a, this is zero game plan change really when you go from what Baker Mayfield to do to to what Case Keenum could do. I think it's Baker light is really what you get out of the offense there. 
They're going to continue to be relying on the run game. They're going to continue to be relying on play action. They're going to hope not to get into a lot of third and long situations. But really, I think you you could expect uh, Baker Light, which, by the way, if Baker plays, you'll get Baker Light too because he's not healthy. The key thing in this game is physicality. Whether Whether we get good Baker showing up or bad Case Keenum, good Ben, bad Ben, this game is a division AFC North game. This game is about physicality. If there's one thing the Steelers can do to give themselves a chance, if they out physical the Browns when they're on defense, if they really bring it to that Browns offensive line that I was complimenting earlier, that's going to be a heck of a matchup from a football purist standpoint. And then, you know, likewise, on the other side of the ball, they're going to have to find a way to, to, to hang with that Browns defensive line. This is a team that's built really strong up front. It's a, it's a great way to build a football team. So out physical is basically just beating the offensive lineman off the snap? Out physical is, is everything. It's from, you know, how fast you play, how fast you run around the field, how who's winning, you know, the battle of the contact, where's the, the low man wins, who's really firing off into each other. Some of it's just toughness. Some of it's personality that you see on the field out there. You know, it's always going to be offensive linemen have the advantage of knowing where they're going. And they're always going to be a little bit more of the, the cerebral type approach where the best defenses are going to be flying around and just trying to take people's heads off. Not literally, but, you know, trying to trying to really play as fast as possible and as hard as possible. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about violence when I talk about physicality. So, all right. So watch the physicality in the Brown Steelers game. That's your high watchability factor there. The Saints are on a short week. They host the Bucks and Tom Brady, who comes off a crush of the Bears. Did you see anything in the Saints win on Monday night, a game that I found pretty boring, that made you say, yeah, they can hold Tom Brady down like they held Aaron Rodgers down? So you're still not watching the Manning cast? I did watch the Manning cast. It was, and and I, sounded boring. I watched, the, I watched the fourth quarter of the game. I was much more into anything that they were saying than the, what was actually happening on the field. I thought it was so awesome the way that Breeze was kind of breaking down like what Sean Payton is thinking here. Who knows better than Drew Breeze what, what Sean Payton's thinking from an offensive strategic standpoint. Obviously, he wasn't you know spilling, spilling the, the, the real juice there, but I, I had a lot of fun listening to that. I even like I found myself liking Tom Brady while he was on in the second quarter. Marshawn Lynch was hilarious. But yeah, the game. Oh yeah, the football game. The Saints pass defense has been good. They've been good this year. They have good players back there who can play man coverage, but they also mix up their looks. DA uh, Dennis Allen does a lot of good stuff mixing up what he does back there. So it's not just going to be one vanilla look all the time. He likes to bring the pressures. You'll see them bring bring zero pressures sometimes, things like that too. But then they'll also back up. They'll play some, some two-man. They'll play some quarters. They'll play some single high. So I think that they have the combination of man coverage talent with the mix and looks back there that they, that they can give Brady as much trouble as, you know, anybody can give Brady. You know, not many people giving Brady trouble these days. But I will say it's much harder to be a zone defense that goes into a matchup feeling like you have to play man wherever you're going, then vice versa. They're in the situation of really being a man, a primarily man defense, but then they can mix up the, some of the zone looks. And I think that as far as facing Tom Brady, that's that's better strategy than most. So you're making it sound like the Saints have a shot in this, and they have a shot to impact Tom Brady, who, by the way, is now our number one quarterback in the world's number one quarterback rankings. What's going to be the hard part for them? I think the harder part for the Saints is actually not on the back end. It's finding a way to affect Tom Brady with the pass rush. The Bucks have been near the top of the league in both passing, like you just mentioned, and blocking total points. They've, they've had one of the best offensive lines in the league to this point this year. And the Saints pass rush has been really quiet. The guy that they need to get going is the same guy that's been doing it for, for 10 years for them, Cam Jordan. Despite being sackless so far this year, he does have 19 pressures. So usually we see that pressure rate tend to be more predictive going forward. I'll be focused on him when the Bucks have the ball. He's the guy that if there's going to be one person that can, I think, really affect Brady, that you need to get something going with that with that front four. He's the guy. He's the guy for the Saints. You want to go back to the uh, 19 and zero? That's significant for Cam Jordan. I know that that's something that we've written about too, right? The pressure is predictive of sacks. Yes, and Bryce Rossler actually worked on a new statistic that we invented in the offseason called pressures above expectation, which basically tells you based on your expected pressure rate, how many pressures you're likely to get based on all kinds of different factors that figure into the formula. And then kind of like you have completion percentage above expectation, you can have pressures above expectation based on what the expected rate is based on all of your alignments and usages and, and all that kind of stuff and, and how many you actually get. So when you actually combine 
the expected pressure rate with the pressures above expectation, those two separate elements, you can get even better at predicting future pressure and therefore sack performance than you could with any of these statistics alone. Probably too hard to explain on a podcast right there, but basically we have even better ways to find you know predictive measures in that sense. One more point that I'll add. At the end of the day, I think, you know, looking back at when the Saints have the ball in this one, Sean Payton knows that this is a tough matchup. He's not accustomed to the other team having a better quarterback than him. And so I think when the Saints have the ball, which is which is Sean Payton time, I think he's going to try to find a way to manufacture a win, screening and confusing the Bucs as much as possible. It might not look like your standard run game, which people have been reticent to really rely on against the Bucs, but I do think he will try to find a way to control the game, including the pace of the game with his offense and keep Brady off the field. So I'm really looking forward to that chess match as well, not just whether or not Cam Jordan and the, and the Saints can find a way to pressure Brady when he's going, but also how Sean Payton approaches the, the strategic chess match here of understanding that he doesn't have Drew Brees to go toe-to-toe with Tom Brady. He's going to have to figure out a different way to manufacture things. One of the things that I like here is uh, the first game that we talked about, Brown Steelers, physicality. Second game that we talk about, chess match, completely different like that. That brings us to brief commercial here. Certainly check out our content, the Sports Info Solutions blog, sportsinfosolutionsblog.com, literally the title. You'll find articles such as ones explaining how pressures above expectation works. We also feature content regularly on Sharp Football. You can find uh, a number of different things, particularly in the gambling space there. Corey March and our team of SIS R&B analysts putting together that. You can check that out at Sharp Football. So that's two games that we've talked about. Third game's Patriots-Chargers. So I feel like we're moving into phase two of Mac Jones' rookie season, if that makes sense. He's had close losses to the Bucs and the Cowboys. He's coming off the laugher against the Jets. Now, Chargers, Panthers on the road. Sledding gets a little more tough. What are you watching for in this game from Mac Jones? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, it's funny because I think back to when we were doing the rookie handbook and, and all the offseason conversation, we said Mac Jones was going to be the low ceiling, high floor, ready to play po- prospect on the bunch. And it's exactly what he's been. He's, we said he was the guy that you kind of know what he's going to be. And he's been what we thought he was going to be, where all the other first round quarterbacks have been all over the place and, and kind of typical rookie quarterbacks, just uh, unpredictable. He's been in a great situation in New England. That's part of what happens when you're the last of the five quarterbacks to go off the board in that first round. And, and what he makes me think of is a perspective that, that our vice president, excuse me, of basketball, Jake Lose, he has a great perspective that, you know, when you can really measure amateur prospects well, lower level prospects well, for whatever you're talking about, NBA, NFL, MLB, you can get a much better idea of their floor, right? How well you perform on the lower levels, that's really going to give you the best indication of what a player's floor, floor can be. How productive is he right now? And he's always made the point that actually knowing a player's floor is much valuable than most people give it credit for. Yeah, we want to know what the upside is. And the upside is an important factor in the analysis as well, um, especially when you're talking about, you know, like basketball, which is which is what he's focused on. But the idea that if you can really measure them well, then you can really understand the floor well. What better example of that do we have than Mac Jones, who, who led all of our statistics last year? We had a really good idea of, ex- of exactly what level he was going to come into the league at, even if we're not sure how much room for growth there is. We're halfway through the season, and he's been the best rookie. And you're seeing a number of the high-variance quarterbacks, and and some of them are are certainly struggling to this point. With this game specifically, Chargers can rack up a lot of points potentially. What happens if this becomes a shootout? Yeah, and I think that's, that's exactly it. That's exactly the question, right, about that upside. It's nice to have a quarterback who isn't the reason why you lose. You know Belichick values that. But can he at least be a part of the reason why you win? Maybe not always the reason why you win games, but at least a part of the reason why you win. That's what we call that win with quarterback. And unless you want to build your team around Trent Dilfer, at some point, <laughs> you're going to have to make plays to beat the great quarterbacks in the playoffs. The, the Justin Herberts of the world, that's, that's what he's going to be measured against. That's what he's going to compete against while he's in the NFL. So Belichick's going to do everything in his power to copy that Ravens blueprint to run the ball on this struggling Chargers defense. But if Mac has to step up, can he? And where is that ceiling, right? If we got the floor settled, okay, let, what can that ceiling actually be? Maybe, as Jake would point out, maybe his ceiling is a little bit higher than we're giving it credit for by virtue of his floor being so high. Meanwhile, it's kind of phase two for Justin Herbert as well, right? He gets embarrassed by the Ravens, then he has the bye. What are you watching for from him? 
Yeah, well, Herbert actually isn't a stranger to putting up a stinker. So last year, flashback, he goes 20 for 32 for a buck 87 against the Dolphins in week 10. Has to his point, to that point, his worst game. Then he comes back and he throws for 366 and three touchdowns the next week. Yes, it was against the Jets, but uh, he did it all the same. Then he had his worst game of the season in week 13 against the Patriots, going 26 for 53, right? Less than 50% for 209 yards. We're talking about four yards per attempt, zero touchdowns and two interceptions. But he came back in week 14, went 36 for 44 for 243, two touchdowns and one pick against the Falcons. So we have seen him bounce back before. We've seen him put up the stinker and we've seen him bounce back. The problem is that both of those games that he had negative total points last year, he faced the same Patriots team that he'll be facing this week. And then Brian Flores in Miami, who runs a very similar scheme to what Belichick is doing. So last week, Wink Martindale got the best of Herbert. This week, It'll be very interesting to see how the Chargers try to attack that, that Belichick defense. Is there another aspect of this game that has a high watchability factor beyond the quarterbacks? Well, I mean, that's the most interesting part for me. I mean, how do Brandon Staley, Joe Lombardi, Justin Herbert, and the Chargers passing game match wits with Belichick? Going back to another, another one of these, these chess battles, you're always going to get that when you get Belichick involved in a game. The way that, that he had so much success against Herbert last year, but... This is a whole different offensive staff and a whole different real attack right now. So it'll be interesting. If there's something that, that'll be a little bit easier to watch on the screen because seeing all those, those coverages play out will be a little bit more difficult, it's Matt Judon. Look for the red sleeves. He's 15th in pass rush total points so far this year. He rushes about 75% of the time, and he has the 13th highest pressure rate in the NFL when he does rush. So watch for those red sleeves. He's been a real stud on that Patriots defense so far this year. Brand Steelers, I wrote, describe it in a word, physical. Saints, Bucks, describe it in a word, chess. Chargers, Patriots, I think the reason I kind of chuckled, I wrote down the word pendulum. Which way does the pendulum swing for Mac Jones and Justin Herbert? And I guess we'll find out. One last thing to point out, because I think it could come into play down the road as the teams are trying to, you know, as the Patriots are fighting for a playoff spot, that week one loss to the Dolphins may come back and hurt the Patriots. This game being four and four is so much different from being three and five with what they have left because they've got two games left still with the Bills. Cowboys, Vikings, let's move on to them. Another injury situation here, same kind of thing with as Mayfield, Dak Prescott dealing with an injured calf. How will this impact how he plays? That's a tough question. I think that there were a lot of questions coming into the year, coming off of injury. What would Dak be? It's hard to know without knowing really the specifics of the injury of the injury going on there. But you know, if I have to guess, it, I think Dak Prescott, if he's on the field, we should expect him to play well. These receivers have been great so far this year. He's been he's been great so far this year. The rushing game has done well for them. The, they've been good up front. They're a top ten team in all four phases of offense: passing, rushing, receiving, and blocking. So I'm not too concerned about what they're doing kind of on the offensive side of the ball there, especially with the Vikings having struggled a bit on defense so far this year. What are the Vikings defensively? We've mentioned a few things related to advanced stats in the past. Arif Hassan had an article in The Athletic pointing out how Minnesota's advanced defensive stats are better than their traditional ones. They started 0-2, lost two close games. What do we make of the Vikings at this point? The Vikings, by the SIS numbers, it's been really rough from a run defense perspective and not good from a pass coverage perspective either. But the pass rush has been the one unit that's showed up for them. Based on our metrics, we don't have them ranking very highly as a defense. You know, we, their passing offense, we've absolutely loved. As you pointed out, that's really been the strength of their team so far this year. They, they've been kind of hot and cold up front on both sides of the ball. And I think that's going to be the challenge in this game because the Cowboys, especially the Cowboys offensive line, is a problem to go up against. When I look at the, the Vikings defense, it's, it's can they hold up against the really good offensive lines in the league is kind of the biggest question that I have about them. Vikings have a brutal schedule. You could easily see them going from three and three to three and seven, and you wouldn't bat an eye. They play the Cowboys, the Ravens, the Chargers, and the Packers in four consecutive games. Kirk Cousins up at the total at the top of the total points rankings, maybe not for long. What's the thing in this game with the highest watchability factor? The, the total points rankings, just watching Kirk Cousin and Derek Carr move up and down the list is this pretty good watchability factor. In terms of in terms of this game, my favorite thing to watch has been CeeDee Lamb so far this year. CeeDee Lamb, I think, has 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 been a pleasure to watch from the Cowboys. He's he's got an exciting style about him that I think kind of even exceeds his production. So that's one thing that that 
every time I, I, I'm watching the Cowboys, he's kind of stealing the, the, the show for me in terms of where my eyes go on the film. So again, the one word idea, Brown Steelers, we said physical, going to be a, a extremely physical game. Saints, box chess, chess match between the two coaching staffs. Chargers, Patriots, pendulum, because we don't know which way it's going to swing for Mac Jones and Justin Herbert. What's the one word for Cowboys Vikings? The one word. You're the word guy, Mark. I got. I know. The, uh, the one word for Cowboys Vikings. Prescott, uh, right? Let's go. Prescott's a good one. Let's go. Variance. Variance. There's some variance I think that we could see in this game, depending on w- which sort of Vikings team shows up, the health of Dak Prescott, and then the Vikings. I think in a larger sense. Super high variance team right now in terms of like you said, are they good or or are they bad or I don't know. Makes for a good football game. Makes for interesting watching, certainly, right? Absolutely. And this wraps up off the charts for week eight. You can find our content at the Sports Info Solutions blog at Sharp Football and at Football SI underscore SIS on Twitter. For Matt Manicharian and our producer Justin Stein, I'm Mark Sign. Thank you for listening to the Off the Charts Football Podcast. <laughs>